Ladies and gentlemen, critter enthusiasts and eco enthusiasts alike, welcome to another thrilling episode of Eric Likes Animals. As always, I'm your ever excited host, Eric Mahan, and today we're going to be diving into the wild world of environmental news and, of course, creatures that make this planet our home. Whether you're a first time explorer or a seasoned listener, I'm thrilled to have you along for the journey. So why don't we get started and buckle up for some environmental news. First up, reported by The Guardian, hundreds of lizards rescued in police bust of alleged Australian criminal animal export syndicate. Okay, got through that one. The NSW police have reportedly dismantled a criminal syndicate suspected of orchestrating an illegal export of Australian reptiles valued at a whopping $1 million to Hong Kong. In September 2023, a strike force was initiated with collaboration from the state and federal departments to probe unlawful activities related to the exportation of native animals and reptiles. The investigation was triggered by the interception of nine packages containing 59 live lizards en route to Hong Kong. Also, between December 20th and January 5th, the strike force conducted search operations and vehicle interceptions in a number of areas around Sydney, leading to the apprehension of a 41-year-old woman and three men aged 31, 54, and 59. Two of the arrests individuals had been denied bail, and all four suspects now face multiple charges, including the illegal export of native reptiles, handling the proceeds of crime, and participating in a criminal group. In the course of a police search conducted in East Hills, authorities discovered 118 lizards, three snakes, eight eggs, and 25 unfortunately deceased lizards. The police allege that the criminal group engaged in capturing live lizards and other native Australian reptiles for profitable export to Hong Kong. These animals were reportedly confined in small containers prepared for packaging and shipment. Throughout this investigation, officers located a total of 257 lizards, which were transported to various zoos and wildlife parks to find better homes. A veterinarian examined them before releasing them back into their natural habitats. Law enforcement authorities estimated that the total value of all these seized reptiles to be approximately $1.2 million, based on an average evaluation of $5,000 per lizard. But of course, the real price of the wild and the wild loss of these animals would have been much higher. Next up, also from The Guardian, Plants, birds, feral pigs, the invasive species that cost the U.S. millions. So globally, the economic impact of invasive species reaches about $423 billion annually, with a significant portion of these losses concentrated in the United States. The estimated cost of damage attributed to invasive species in the United States stands at about $120 billion per year year. Although that figure may have evolved since the last assessment of this was conducted only in 2005. Human activities, whether related to travel or transport of goods, have led to the introduction of more than a whopping 37,000 species into new and not their own habitats. This includes animals, plants, algae, and disease-carrying insects, introduced either intentionally or accidentally through both land and water channels. Once established, these invasive species have the potential to outcompete native flora and fauna and disrupt existing ecosystems that serve as vectors for disease. The consequence of these introduced animals extend beyond environmental impacts and actually include economic losses on a global scale. Some of these animals that are the heavy hitters, so to speak, when it comes to all of this are, first up, zebra mussels. First identified in the United States in the 1980s, zebra mussels originally from the Caspian and Black Seas in Eurasia have spread to various American water bodies, normally including the Mississippi River, the Great Lakes, the Hudson River, and Lake Travis. Forming large clusters, these mussels disrupt ecosystems by attaching to shellfish, filtering out essential algae, 
and thus causing issues in water treatment plants. The resulting damage cost the U.S. over $1 billion annually. Next up, and a personal hatred of mine because they've flown into my face multiple times, is spotted lanternflies. Emerging in the U.S. in 2014, spotted lanternflies have expanded their presence in states such as New Jersey, Connecticut, Maryland, Virginia, Indiana, and Ohio, as well as Pennsylvania. Likely introduced through trade shipments, these pests hitchhike on trains, cars, trucks, and, well, planes. Despite their name, spotted lanternflies are actually strong flyers. An economic study from Pennsylvania estimates potentially the annual cost or devastation of costs of these animals are $324 million, primarily stemming from loss in the wine industry, since those are one of these animals' favorite things to attack. Next up, ornamental plants. Like I said, it's not all animals. Some ornamental invasives, including the Japanese barberry, baby's breath, and blue lime grass sold in nurseries and plant shops can become problematic. Well, not as harmful as other invasive species, these plants initially brought into gardens for their novelty can thrive outside their intended environment and outcompete native plants. And there's no real economic price on this one, but since they are outcompeting native plants, that's kind of priceless. European starlings introduced to New York Central Park in 1890. The European starling, introduced for literary reasons, or whatever, <laughs> nearly drove the eastern bluebird to extinction due to nesting site competition. Considered a pest in agriculture, starlings consume food meant for cattle and pose threats to fruit and grain crops. Estimated damage from starlings reached $800 million in 2000, and efforts to control them resulting in over a million being killed in 2021. And lastly, a big one, the feral pigs. Widely recognized as one of the most detrimental invasive species globally, feral pigs are present in at least 35 U.S. states. Feeding on vegetation, these pigs destroy plants to their roots, impacting soil and endangered rare plants. They also pose health risks carrying various diseases and parasites transmissible to humans and other animals. The damages from feral pigs are estimated to cost around $2.5 billion annually, with Texas being significantly affected. It's also noteworthy that similar to species threatening the U.S., Native American species can also cause problems in other parts of the world. For instance, the North American gray squirrel is considered invasive in the U.K., while also carrying deadly squirrel pox and outcompeting native red squirrels for food. Showing that invasive species not only can cause major issues for the wild world, but also the human's precious economic one, too. Then finally, it's a short one, but well written by the BBC. Common lizard found at Rutland Water for first time in 15 years. Common lizards have been discovered at Rutland Water for the first time in 15 years. Over 50 of these reptiles were relocated from a development site at Wing Water Treatment Works at Locks Hill at Rutland Water Nature Reserve in 2007. But despite being initially deemed a failure due to the absence of traces in the subsequent surveys, both adult and young lizards have been spotted at the site during this summer. Tim Sexton, the Senior Species and Recording Officer at the Rutland Wildlife Trust, expressed excitement over the news, stating, It is a fantastic news to receive. The first record of common lizard sightings at Rutland Water this summer, over 15 years since the project to translocate them away from a new development, took place. Sexton emphasized that this rediscovery underscores the potential for wildlife to thrive with careful management and patients. Although common lizards are not currently classified as rare or endangered in Britain, their numbers are declining due to habitat loss. Notably, these lizards differ from other British reptiles as they give birth to live young rather than eggs. Yes, that's a thing. The successful rediscovery at Rutland Water highlights the positive impact of conservation efforts on sustaining and revitalizing local wildlife populations. And that's it for your environmental news.
So since we just got off the holiday, I thought I wanted to talk to you guys today about something a little bit different. And in this case, one of the world's deadliest animals to exist. And that animal is the textile cone snail. Now, cone snails in general have one of the deadliest venoms on earth. And of that group, textile cone snails have some of the strongest. So let's dive on in to this marine snail that has one of the strongest toxins known to science. So first up, you're probably like to know where they live so you don't accidentally pick one up. Well, the textile cone snail are home to the coral reefs normally buried in the sand or under some rocks in the Indian Ocean or Indo-Pacific region, which includes Australia, Eastern Africa, and even Hawaii and French Polynesia. And as for some quick stats on these guys, the average size of the cone snail is about 10 centimeters or 4 inches, although of course their size may vary among other species of cone snails. The weight of the cone snail is typically around 26 grams, and cone snails have a lifespan of about 20 years in the wild, although this can also vary depending on the species and environmental conditions. As for what they look like, their shell characteristics are the shape of it is of a marine cone snail of high gloss and possess a heavy body. It has a short spine with straight or slightly concave sides. The body whorl is convex, exhibiting rounded or slightly angled shoulders, and the surface texture is a slight spiral ridge can be observed near the base of the shell while the rest of the surface is quite smooth. Basically, it looks like a shell, not going to lie. But the color and the patterns are kind of a dead giveaway. The background color of the shell varies and can be described as some variation of white or bluish white. But the markings of the shell is adorned with light to dark brown or yellowish overlapping textile markings. Hence why they are named textile cone snails. They also have spiral bands. There are three interrupted spiral bands on the shell displaying a yellowish or brown coloration. It's worth noting that the color and pattern descriptions indicate a high level of variability within these species, showcasing the beauty and diversity found in marine cone snails. But they are fairly recognizable. Pretty much, if you see a really pretty shell, probably shouldn't pick it up, especially if it looks like it has textile patterns across it. Now, packing as much venom as these guys do, they can go crazy with as much color as they want, especially since color in the wild for many animals means danger. And it's a warning saying that I don't really need to hide because if you mess with me, it's going to end really badly for you. And the cone snail possesses a highly dangerous and intricate venomous harpoon. Now, it's kind of like a specialized tooth that contains a potent combination of venoms and has the power to be lethal to humans. In fact, the venom of a single snail is believed to be powerful enough to kill as many as 700 people. Also, marine snails are known to be quick to sting, with their harpoon-like sting. Their stingers, by the way, are sharp and strong. They have even been known to pierce wetsuits, making encounters with them even more hazardous, particularly in underwater settings. However, I should emphasize, the 700 people is all of the venom within the snail. It might not inject all of it. They might only just do a little bit just to get you away. So, that 700 people thing, it's not... 100% certain that they will inject all of it in you if you ever come across it, but you should still stay away. Now, the effects of a cone snail sting can vary widely. In some cases, the sting is almost painless and swiftly followed by paralysis. Alternatively, it can be extremely painful, accompanied by a range of local and systematic symptoms. They produce a wide range of toxins, so that can mean a wide range of reactions. However, the wide-ranging toxins have led to some interesting discoveries. For the venom of the cone snail contains a notable painkiller component. The painkiller property has shown promise in medical research, particularly in the development of acute pain treatments for individuals who may not respond well or cannot receive traditional opioids. Researchers have even suggested that the venom's painkilling effects are comparable to morphine, a potent pain relieving opioid, but without the associated risk of addiction. However, what I truly find one of the most fascinating facts about these snails and their venom is that they seem to have two different cocktails at their ready of venom. They use for two different purposes, one for offense and one for defense. 
Now, the venom of these cone sales is essentially a complex cocktail of small proteins, each designed to affect different targets in various ways. One specifically tailored for hunting, the venom appears to be a specialized blend of proteins that is effective against the preferred fish or mollusk species, yet seemingly inactive in humans. So this specific one really won't affect us. It's tailored for them to catch prey. However, what set these snails apart is the presence of a secondary or backup venom. When threatened, the cone snail releases a much more lethal blend of toxins that can rapidly lead to human death. This dual venom strategy is a common trait across all cone snails. And it is theorized that this evolution as a defense mechanism against predation subsequently enables them to target larger prey during hunting. Now, the ability of the cone snails to switch between these two different toxins represent a remarkable adaptation. This dynamic capability is not only unique to these snails, but is also observed to be an unevolving trait. The continual evolution of this defense and hunting mechanism showcases that adaptability and complexity of these marine creatures. Now, it seems a little crazy to think about anything than wanting to make an escargot snack out of these snails, but sea turtles and rays will risk it. Both are no stranger to going after things that, well, can pack a punch, with one of the main parts of many sea turtle diets actually including jellyfish. Yet, just like jellyfish, the cone snail doesn't just use its venom for defense, but also offense. And when the textile cone snail likes most is other mollusks, things like clams, oysters, and yes, even other snails, and even their own kind, if food is scarce. All, all on the menu. Other cone snail species are also known to be fish hunters, but no matter what's on the menu, that quick harpoon and almost instant paralysis makes sure that no prey can get away once the textile cone snail gets a hold of them. Now, their average attack lasts only milliseconds. They use stealth, but in the end, these slow-moving animals have one of the quickest attacks out there. How it finds its prey, by the way, is also quite interesting. It has a siphon that it uses to suck in water and smell in which direction their tasty snacks are hiding out. Now, the textile cone snail does, of course, have eye stalks, but it uses its smell to lead them to their prey. The siphon kind of extends out, and even more, it moves around, sort of like an elephant's trunk, but working like a forked tongue of a lizard does, helping it give directions like a metal detector as it sweeps the siphon around, trying to find out where the smell is the strongest. Now, as for reproduction in cone snails, it has not been extensively studied. It appears that most of these snails exhibit separate sexes. In this reproductive strategy, individuals are either male or female. That is not always the case when it comes to snails and slugs. Fun fact. Additionally, it is observed that fertilization is internal, a characteristic shared by many marine gastropods. Internal fertilization involves the transfer of sperm from a male cone snail to a female, where fertilization of eggs take place within the female's reproductive tract. The reproductive process of the textile cone snail involves the production of egg capsules, each containing a substantial number of eggs. These capsules are typically laid beneath rocks. However, the survival rate of these eggs is notably low. The hatching period of these eggs that manage to survive is around 16 to 17 days. Once hatched, the larvae enter a pelagic stage, meaning they float or drift in the water for approximately 16 days. After this phase, the larva then settles on to the substrate, or the sandy bottom. At that time of settling, they measure normally around 1.5 millimeters, or about 0.06 inches in length. Once they're down there, they will feed and grow and eventually become adult snails that will jab other snails with their harpoon in no time. Now, on to the conservation bit. According to the IUCN Red List, they list the textile cone snail as least concern, population trend, unspecified. I should mention it's probably because the last time that was updated was in 2011. So basically, they know that the last time they looked at the species, it had a good population, but in the end, they need to do another survey and research, especially in the habitat, to be able to talk about how the population trend is going, as well as all those other little details. After all, the IUCN Red List has a lot of species, aka the whole world, to try and keep up with. Uh, they'll try and get to it when they get to it. However, there are two main conservation threats. We can talk about these snails. 
Number one is as dangerous as these snails are, their shells are quite beautiful designs and are known to be very sought after. The other major loss is habitat. They live in coral reefs and they need to be in the hustle and bustle of these reefs so they have a chance of finding and getting enough food or things to stab at. Yet the effect known as coral bleaching can ruin these habitats in which these snails rely on. After all, what is coral bleaching? Well, coral is a living creature. In fact, it is made up of millions of little creatures called polyps. And in coral, it is in fact an animal, not a plant. However, it does sort of cheat because coral alone just can't survive. But coral or polyps build these amazing coral structures that then house algae within it. Now, this algae and the coral polyps have a symbiotic or win-win relationship. The algae gets a protected area in the coral tissue to live, and the coral can provide resources for the algae to photosynthesize. The algae then gives the carbohydrates and other resources it makes to the coral to feed on, or at least that's what happens when everything is well. When waters even just get slightly warmer than normal, the coral will then get stressed. And when it gets stressed, it expels the algae. Because that algae is what gives the coral its color, the coral then turns white. Now, the coral is not dead right away. No, it's a defense. It can't run the risk in this stressful environment to be sharing or dealing with algae. So the algae has to go. Yet, if conditions don't get back to healthy soon, yes, the coral or the polyps that make up the coral will starve and die. Other things like chemicals or other major stresses can also cause coral to bleach. And since something like warm waters is not an isolated incident within a reef, major loss of corals have been reported happening around the world. In fact, in the United States in 2005, half of the coral in the Caribbean were lost in one bleaching event. So it's not always something slow that happens over a long time. And with these hotter and hotter summers, you can expect loss of vast amounts of coral in a blink of an eye. So what can we do? Well, the shell one is the collectors. Just don't buy the shells. If you find one naturally, I wouldn't even risk picking it up just in case something is still alive in there. And just appreciate that they exist. And don't bring one home and put it in a glass bowl in your bathroom because, well, you want a beach theme ambiance in there and you thought the shell would be pretty in there. Just leave it in the ocean. Also, some areas have also started creating regulations and laws against selling certain cone snail species shells. And so far, no one seems endangered yet, cone snail wise, but the vast amounts being harvested definitely still have science worried and watching. Now, as for coral bleaching and just saving corals in general, reducing your carbon footprint will help global warming portion. Switching to renewable energy can help stop oil spills and other possible pollution problems in the water. And a little more personal for your home, if you ever go and want to kind of snorkel or scuba in a coral reef, make sure you don't put on certain makeup, though I'm not sure why you would put makeup on if you're about to jump in the water. But also you need to look after harmful sunscreens if you're swimming in a reef. They do make reef safe sunscreens. I know they don't work as well as the ones full of toxins, but if you're going to be specifically in a coral reef, please wear the reef safe sunscreen because that helps with not putting harmful chemicals into the water that can have side effects to this very delicate ecosystem. And if you love snorkeling in the reef so much that you want to bring it home, and build a saltwater fish tank, just make sure you buy from reputable dealers that get things from renewable farm growers when it comes to coral and not getting it from people that poach it from the wild. After all, corals have enough going on as it is. Yet, if we do that and a number of other things, we can keep these beautiful and yes, dangerous snails around for years to come. The amazing textile cone snail. And that's the show. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the textile cone snail. As always, make sure to check me out on Facebook, X, AK, Twitter, TikTok, or you can just always email me at ericlikesanimals at gmail.com. Links are down in the foot. And of course, once again, thank you for joining me on another wild adventure with Eric Likes Animals.
This is Eric signing off, reminding you that every creature has a story, and sometimes the best stories have fur, feathers, or scales. See you guys next time.